Hi, my name is Mark. I'm an alcoholic. Um, when I accepted this service position, I didn't realize I was going to have to stand up and speak to anybody. So I'm a little nervous. And I'm only introducing the guy, so, you know. Um, I met Seamus yesterday. I picked him up from the airport. You know, much like uh, Lindsay told you last night, if you were here at um, last night's speaker, she got lost going to hobby, coming back from hobby. And she's been in the, she said she'd been in Texas for five years and she didn't know her way around. I've been here for a year. I don't have a clue where anything is. I got lost in my own backyard. Fortunately, I had a GPS and I got there, but then I got into Hobby Airport and I got lost inside Hobby Airport. As you might be aware, it's only one terminal. Um, so after one panicked call to Lindsay to say, I'm lost, I don't know what I'm doing. I finally found uh, Seamus wandering around the, uh, the baggage claim. And I walked past him and I saw, I thought to myself, that guy looks Irish. I think that might be him. So I wandered back over to him with my little sign and said, Seamus? And he went, yes. And uh, I'd found him. And I was really very, very pleased at that. So we, um, I picked him up. And uh, we had a great conversation in the car. It's been great getting to know him. And uh, I've had a great time hanging out, chatting. We had dinner last night, with, uh, all the speakers and that. And it was really a lot of fun. And uh, I really think uh, we're all going to enjoy Seamus talking tonight. You know, and uh, I, uh, yeah, well, I guess without anything, uh, without further ado, I'd like if you could put your hands together for Seamus O. Thanks, Mark. My name is Seamus O'Connor, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, and uh, I'm just really happy to be here. And, and before I start, I have to say this. this the committee has, I mean, they're just, I could not have been felt more welcome and uh, right from the time Mark found me. The first guy he held the sign up to, thinking he was Irish, said, K. Um, and uh, uh, but, but then he got me the second time. Uh, the uh, but uh, so I. Uh, uh, but yeah, it's been wonderful being here. My first time in Texas, uh, and uh, so. Um, but anyway, so I, the committee has been just uh, amazing. So I, I want to thank them. Um, when I first started speaking uh, in AA, which was uh, way too early, uh, <laughs> I, I went to my sponsor and uh, he said, well, generally uh, we start at the beginning and we say what it was like, what happened and what it's like now. And I still tend to follow that. And uh, so um, as you probably could tell, I'm not from around here. Um, and that's why they sent a Scotsman to pick me up. Uh, I'm from Northern Ireland, and uh, Northern Ireland is close to Ireland geographically. Uh, we play. We have better golfers, uh, and uh, uh, we, we're uh, known mostly for fighting with each other. Um, and there's two sides: Catholic and Protestant. Can't, it couldn't even imagine a third side. And uh, uh, and and almost all of us have half our family is uh, Catholic and half is Protestant, half is Scots Irish and half is Irish. And uh, but we're the home of the Scots Irish, and uh, we're you know. Sometimes people mistake us for being white people. We're pink people, actually. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, let's be honest, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, but but anyway, uh, so I was born in Northern Ireland, and I was on the Catholic side, and so about half of my cousins are Protestants of different, uh, you know, Presbyterians who have even more sins than the Catholics, and and the Episcopalians, they're called Church of Ireland over there and they have no sins and we all wanted to be like them you know it was like they didn't have they couldn't commit sin there wasn't any sins you know and um, so uh, but anyway uh, 
I went to school. I, I actually did pretty well in school, and uh, but I was one of those kids, one of those adults, as it turned out, who had no clue what I wanted to do with my life. And um, I knew what you wanted me to do with my life, but I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I knew my family wanted me to be a doctor, and uh, so I was going to be a doctor. And uh, I, uh, but my uncle, who was a doctor, said, "Why don't you spend the summer with me in my practice in England and see how you like it?" And at the end of the summer, he said. Uh, you know, I think you might want to choose something else. <laughs> because I would say things like, yuck, you, you, how do you feel being around sick people all day long? You know, and, and he said, I don't think you have a passion for healing. You know, and, uh, and uh, he said, you'll need a passion for healing to get you through all the shit you have to go through to be a doctor. Um, so I decided, because time was running short, uh, I, I decided to go to seminary. Seminary is the place where they train priests. And uh, I thought, you know, when you're 17, it's going to take seven years. Who knows what will happen in seven years, you know. And so I, I, I went to a seminary, and I went to the university and was doing a degree in philosophy and kind of like one year would end, and I would go home for the summer, and I'd go back in the fall. And I just stayed there. And I wound up getting ordained. After seven years, I was ordained a Catholic priest, and I went home one summer and found out I didn't have a summer vacation. They were waiting for me in Sacramento, California. <laughs> Which, I mean, that just sounds like, how could anybody be that unconscious? And, but, You know, I heard my story. I, I was I, I was at a meeting in San Francisco, and there's a woman, and she was living in Daly City, which is just south of San Francisco. And she told my story. She said, I woke up one day, and I'm in Kmart, and I have two kids. <laughs> and I came to, and I realized the last decision I had made was I was a sophomore at McClatchy High School in Sacramento. And I totally got it. I just did the kind of the next indicated thing in the wrong direction. You know, I just, I, I didn't make any decisions. And uh, so I arrive in Sacramento. I'm a priest. Uh, this is 1960. I'm 23. I mean, Talk about mature. And, uh, uh, you know, so I had a lot of wisdom to impart to the people of Sacramento. And, uh, uh, and uh, after about six months in Sacramento, uh, the novelty wore off. I had gone through the ritual and all the dressing up and everything. You know, the, the, the novelty wears off. And uh, so I, uh, I, I was like, what the hell am I doing here? And uh, so I... Uh, my reaction to it was not like I may, ought to make some career decisions here. Uh, no, my reaction to it was I'm going to work harder because I really then started working harder. I taught high school. If you had been at Bishop Armstrong High School, I probably taught you math. Uh, I worked in the parish. I did converts. I did everything. I was the busiest priest in Sacramento. And I hadn't started drinking yet. See? So I can't even blame alcohol for my insanity. I hadn't even started to drink. So I'm two years in Sacramento, and I'm having trouble getting to sleep, and the pastor of the parish notices this. He hears me wandering around, you know, at 4 o'clock in the morning, and he says, you know, if you're having trouble, I got a bottle of old granddad, a hundred proof, under the sink in the kitchen. You might try it. I uh, don't think so. Uh, a couple of nights later, I'm watching the Johnny Carson show. Kind of date. No, I was actually watching the Jack Parr show, and uh, <laughs> and I thought, damn! During one of these commercials, I'm going to go and try that old granddad hundred proof. 
You know, I poured about two ounces of it. I came in and I sipped it. No water, nothing. And I thought, it started to work on me. And it did more for me than prayer, <laughs> ordination. I never had a sacrament that worked that well. I was saved. I mean, <laughs> it was like, where has this stuff been all my life? Why did nobody tell me about it? And I started then, uh, when I was two years in Sacramento, uh, I'm not stupid. You know, I, I knew a good thing when I saw it. So I used it all the time from then on. Within six months, I was probably drinking about a half a fifth a day. I mean, I just could not. I mean, it just made total sense. If this makes me feel this good, why would I not be using it? And I had no hangovers. I, I ramped up to where I was using a fifth a day. Um, my biggest problem, actually, as a priest, uh, you live in a rectory, your problem is getting rid of empties. <laughs> because the, the rectory is not run by the priest, it's run by the housekeeper. And she's usually some, in our case, some old Irish woman uh, who, like, does your laundry. So she's into everything in your room. You know, there's nothing private. And the only thing I had safe from her was a big steamer trunk I had brought out from Ireland. And I put all my empties into that. And then when Bessie would be on a day off, I'd get some grocery sacks and I'd take out, like, some and put them in the dumper behind, the dumpster behind Safeway or something, you know, at night. And, uh, uh, but... I mean, I was sober a couple of years, and I still had a trunk full of empties. It was like I had a dead body in my closet, you know. <laughs> I, I, I just kept waiting for the parish to have a construction project, you know, so I could put it in the bottom of the dumpster, you know. And uh, but uh, and I did. That's exactly how I got rid of them. And uh, but. Um, in in the middle of all of this, I'm working like hell. I'm drinking like a fifth a day, and I'm not having any hangovers. I see no downside to this drinking. And my friends all know how much I'm drinking, but the big shots don't know, like the bishop and the chancellor and people like that. And I get called into the bishop's office, and they ask me, would I be willing to go for a doctoral program in canon law. That's a kind of code for we're thinking you might make a good bishop. And my friends all thought I was going to be in trouble. And I came out and they're all going, so what was it about? And they thought I'd been caught. And uh, because there was some other stuff going on that I could have been caught at. Uh, we'll get to that later. Um, but, but, uh, and I told them, and they said, what? Canon law? And they said, they don't have a clue who you are, do they? And I said, no. And, and they said, so, so what did you say? And I said, yes, please, you know. Five years in Washington, D.C., starting in 1965, if any of you are old enough to remember what that was like, I mean, that was heaven, you know. And uh, so I, uh, uh, my, my, my friend, uh, Sean O'Leary, who had been through school with me, seminary and college, everything, uh, uh, when I told him, he just, uh, he, he, we had to put on a little dinner for my going away, and he had kidded me, he said, you know, I'll bet you if they had offered you five years ballet, you'd have said yes. So <laughs> it didn't matter anything to get out of Sacramento for five years. Uh, I'd have said yes. And so when I'm going away, he he brings me a a, a, a package, and it's, it's an LP record of Swan Lake. 
and a leotard. You know, that was my going away present from Sacramento. So, uh, <laughs> I'd have said yes to anything to get out of Sacramento. And, uh, so I, I got to, uh, to Washington and I'm in the university and I'm in a residence hall and I'm drinking all the time and, and I'm doing okay scholastically because I can sober up like for two or three weeks before finals, but I start getting major depression. And that was a major thing that happened with me with my drinking. Uh, well, I also got pulled in three times one day for drunk driving. But aside from that, um, uh, the, uh, uh, I, I got major depression. And so in 1968, I called this, the only priest I knew in Sacramento who was a recovering alcoholic. We all avoided him. Um, <laughs> And I, I, that's the measure of my desperation. I called Father Joe. And, uh, uh, and I, I, I told him about a friend that was drinking too much. So after about, you know, 30 seconds, he said, so how much are you drinking? And, and I, I told him and I realized he had caught me. And, and he said, well, he said, you know, when are you coming home? Uh, to Sacramento. I, dro I drove across country always. And so I said, you know, I'll, I should be there maybe the third week of May. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, call me and we'll go to a, me a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, are you sure? Alcoholics Anonymous? I thought it was some Protestant outfit, you know. I mean, <laughs> you know, God forbid, you know. Um, uh, <laughs> good Catholic like me. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, and he's a priest, you know, uh, is he off the rails? Uh, what's wrong with him? Uh, so we, we actually met in Sacramento on a Tuesday night at a place called Creekside. It was one of the big old meetings in Sacramento. And, um, uh, and uh, we meet in the parking lot. And he said, have you been drinking today? And I said, no, I didn't. You told me not to. And I didn't. I, and he said, okay, let's go in. I think they're started already. And we went in and I caught him before we go in the door. And I said, uh, just be really clear about this. I am not joining tonight. <laughs> and he looks at me and I learned something about Father Joe. He never argued with an alcoholic. He looked me in the eye and he said, okay, I got it. Don't sign anything tonight. I said, okay. He said, just listen tonight, you know. <laughs> and so, okay, you know, I, I, I'm not going to sign up for the, you know, the $1,200 program or something, you know. Uh, so, uh you know, so um, I, I'm sitting there really paranoid, you know, and I'm shaking, and they offer me coffee. I say, you've got to be kidding, you know, and uh, coffee. Uh, and, and the only thing I remember about that meeting, and this is kind of uh, odd because some people are offended by foul language at AA. Actually, I was encouraged by it. <laughs> because I think if anybody had said, come on in, brother, I would have run. You know, so what I was sitting there and they're using four letter words and talking about this effing spiritual program, you know, and it's like, <laughs> wow, <laughs> this is at least different, you know, <laughs> I mean, by that time I had religion up to here, you know, and it, and it was like, well, maybe this might work, you know, this is definitely different. And uh, so that's about the only thing I took out of the first meeting is that they cuss and they talk about spirituality. And, uh, and, 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 you know, I went to a couple of meetings then the next uh, week and I called uh, Father Joe and I told him, because uh, I was drunk, uh, and I, I told him this AA isn't working. Do you have any other suggestions? And uh, I, I took the book. I, I didn't even know there was a book till the second meeting. And, uh, and the second meeting, I, I got a book, and I thought, I can do the home study course. <laughs> I didn't know there was a book. If I'd known there was a book, you know, uh, I, the, the, cor the classes that they kept saying keep coming back was like, I thought that was for the slow people, you know. Uh, 
<laughs> and I needed to explain to them. I could read the book. Um, so anyway, so I, I said, do you have any other suggestions? And he said, actually, yeah. He said, some people need something different. And I said, okay. Uh, so he put me in his car the next morning, and he took me to what in those days we called a fidget farm. And a fidget farm is a place for people who are shaky. And and uh, uh, they, I stayed there for uh, 30 days, and uh, I, I got a kind of an idea of AA, and I got a feel for the fact that I could be sober, and these people, um, you know, seemed to have something going for them. And I, I, of course, went back to the university in the fall and, you know, forgot about a lot of it and uh, didn't drink for 14 months, actually, I didn't drink, but I was like on a dry drunk. And, but um, so I, I, I'll come back to that place. It was called Truman's or Mountain Vista Farm. It was in Sonoma, uh, in my, Valley of the Moon, beautiful places in the world. Um, but um, so it took me another, uh, that was 1968, and uh it took me actually till February 1971 to actually get uh, sober to uh, this period of sobriety. And, uh, but um, I, I remember one of the things Father Joe told me about uh, speaking. He said, you know, you're inclined to be a bit of a smart ass. So he said, uh, it's probably a better idea rather than telling them how wise you are or something. Why don't you just tell them how you messed up the program? Because I messed up the program for the first three years I was around it. I did everything wrong. I mean, I didn't get the program, really. I got what I thought was the program. You know, they talk about, uh, you know, many of us hold on to our old ideas. Well, I held on to my own ideas. And I, I let very few of yours in. And uh, so... Uh, I wound up actually um, coming back. I've got my doctorate. I'm now promoted in the Diocese of Sacramento. And and uh, uh, on uh, February the 21st, 1971, I tried to kill myself with my car in the garage with the hose in the back window. And that's how successful my career was at that point. And uh, I had all taken every pill, alcohol, everything I could, and uh, uh, started the car, lay down, passed out, woke up at 4 o'clock in the morning. The car had apparently stalled. <laughs> it was a loner. I had wrecked my car the day before. <clears throat> and never try it in a loner you know it's not a good idea um so uh i i i, I hit the the uh the garage door thing came down it was a big garage with like five cars in it and i i staggered out and I, my uh on the 22nd of february um uh, as it dawned i'm like sitting out on the playing field behind the catholic school uh in sacramento listening to the frogs and I decided at that point that I had, I guess I surrendered. I called the toughest guy in Sacramento that I knew who, who ran a recovery house, Sacramento Recovery House. And I went into Sacramento Recovery House. And uh, so, um, but when when Father Joe told me um, to to talk about the things that uh, I messed up, the, the person I really need to talk about is this guy who ran this recovery house. Uh, his name was Walter from Philadelphia. Uh, Walter McCusker is his name. He, he's passed on many years ago. But Walter from Philadelphia, and that was his professional name because Walter had been a problem solver and for some of the problems he solved, he did hard time in San Quentin and Folsom. Uh, he was a hitman and uh, a bad dude, I mean, in his day. Uh, but he always came to meetings with a suit 
and a tie and a big stick pin, and he would introduce himself, I'm Walter from Philadelphia. <laughs> and, and, you know, he, so we all knew what Walter from Philadelphia had done in the past, so when Walter lost his temper with you, you kind of paid attention. And so... <clears throat> So after I got out of the recovery house, part of the deal was that I come back every Monday night for an, an AA meeting. And we're at an AA meeting about, I'm three months out of the house. I'm sober again. I'm like, this is great. And, and Walter throws out the topic, well, why don't you all talk about the insanity of alcoholism tonight? So we start talking about the insanity of alcoholism. One guy talks about like how he drove over the grapevine from L.A. to Bakersfield and doesn't even remember it in the winter time. And somebody else did something else, who spent all his money and whatnot. And I was waiting with my story. I had my insanity story. You know, like when it's going around the room, you know, you're preparing your insanity story. And I had a good one. And it was like that I had gotten my Ford Galaxy 500. I had tried turning it on the tracks of the Western Pacific railway line and got wedged. I didn't know that it exactly matched the gauge of the Western Pacific railway line at midnight and got stuck. I had to have a tow truck come at midnight to take me off. And I just got through with my insanity story when this kitchen chair flies off the wall Walter grabs it, slams it on the ground, and said, for Christ's sake, will somebody talk about the insanity of alcoholism and shut up about how goofy you were when you were drunk. And he stormed out of the room, and we were all looking at each other like, what's wrong with Walter? I tell you, denial is amazing. I went by three days later, went by the recovery house to stop and have a cup of coffee and I, to check on Walter. How are you feeling today, Walter? And he looks up from his big chair and he says, you still don't get it, do you? He said, for three and a half years, we've watched you relapse and we've listened to you say you were fine until you took that first drink. I said, well, it's the first drink that does it, isn't it? And he said, you're one of these guys that marks up your big book, aren't you? He says, you have it in your car? I said, yeah, bring it in. I brought my big book in. We opened it up. He says, open it up at page 35. What do you got marked on page 35? Uh, I have stuff on 34. (laughs) Well, would you read the top lines of page 35? So we shall describe some of the mental states that precede a relapse into drinking, for obviously this is the crux of the problem. Did you have that underlined? No. Yet they call it the crux of the problem. He said, when you were a kid and you looked at a treasure map, how did you know where the treasure was buried? X. And he says, you know Latin, what is X? Crux. A cross. Oh, the treasure is buried on the top of page 35. So I I had never even seen it. He said, turn back a bit. He said, do you see anything on page 24? And on page 24, I look at it and I say, I don't have anything. Oh, oh, you, are you talking about the italics? <laughs> he says, why do you think it was in italics? Because they thought it was important? He said, no, because they couldn't arrange to put it in neon. And, and he took me through, oh, and he said, as long as you're there, he said, you know, you only read through page 22 of the book. He said, uh, if you look at the top of page 23, and he showed me the top of page 23, which I had never read. And it is ta- it, up until then, it's talked about what happens to you after you take a drink and how we're different from other people. And then it says, however, 
all of the previous remarks would be academic and pointless if our friend never took the first drink. So the problem of the alcoholic resides not in his body, but in his mind. And he said the rest of the book from there on is about the insanity of the sober alcoholic. Shit. <laughs> I thought I was fine until I took that first drink. And he, he took me through the rest of chapter three, and you know, the, once more, the alcoholic at certain times has no effective mental defense against the first drink, you know. You know and and, and I, I said, you know, I, he told me afterwards, he said, I looked at you, he said, we had gone through all of that stuff, and he said, all I could think of was an old cigarette machine where I put the money in, and nothing happens. Because he said, you kind of look at me and go, yeah. And I've had this with sponsees, you know, too. You tell them something that they obviously haven't a clue about, and they go, yeah, uh, your point is, you know, and and that's uh, obvious. And he said, you know, if you had been a cigarette machine, I'd have slammed you. But he said, I took one more chance at you. And this is what he did. He said, you had not had anything to drink or you had no drugs for seven months before you relapsed. Right. He said, you got in your car at St. Anne's Rectory and you drove up Freeport Boulevard to Hollywood Bottle Shop. I remember you telling me that. Is that right? I said, yeah. Driving up Freeport Boulevard, is there any alcohol or drugs in you? No, not for seven months. You go in, you buy the bottle, and you get back in your car and you drive back down Freeport Boulevard. Is there any alcohol or drugs in you? No, not for seven. You go into your room, you pour some in a glass, and then he raised his coffee cup and he said, even when it's up here, is there any alcohol or drugs in you? Not for seven months. And then you do this. And he said, and you have been telling everybody for three and a half years that you were fine until that chemical entered your body. He said, if you don't know that you were batshit crazy driving up Freeport Boulevard in the liquor store, driving back down Freeport Boulevard, he said, if you don't know you were already insane before the chemical entered you, he said, you ought to find a chapter of Morons Anonymous. <laughs> and I'm standing there and I got it. And I was scared. It really scared me because I had no idea. And it turned out, you see, that I hadn't really got a spiritual program because I didn't know I was insane. So I thought I was fine until I, the chemical would get into me, in which case then I would be insane. But I didn't know that I needed the spiritual program to keep my insanity at bay when I was sober because you always pick up the first drink sober. And I said that to Walter. I said, you scared the hell out of me. And you mean that clean and sober, walking along, he said, yeah, you fall through a hole in your brain with no advanced warning from your point of view. And I went to Father Joe, and I said, you know what Walter told me? And he said, yeah, we've all been trying to tell you that. I said, so I, I got to do a spiritual program. And he said, you know, you have to figure out the difference between a religious program and a spiritual program because in the past, as soon as you got sober, you went off on the religion track. And you had to find God and you had to pray to God and you had to become a good boy and you had to do all of this kind of stuff. And he said, that sincere people tried that for 2,000 years at least until 1935. 
he said, I do not want to see you doing something that did not work for 2,000 years. He said, you have to go and find out the difference between a spiritual program and a religious program. Because he said, you know, and, and I, the, the thing I, I keep thinking about is, incidentally, I haven't been a priest for 41 years. Um, I, I, <clears throat> I did get sober that way, too. And uh, I, I've been married for 41 years. And uh, uh, But my wife is an artist, and... Uh, if you had uh, uh, somebody who's an artist in your family, you know you spend a lot of time finding studs in the wall to hang paintings. And you drill into the stud uh, and you hang the painting and then she goes, you know, I wonder if you could move it like about an eighth of an inch that way. Did you ever try drilling a hole one-eighth of an inch to the side of a hole you've already drilled? It goes right back into the same hole, right? It slips right back. The bit will go into the same hole. And that's kept happening to me with spirituality and religion. Before I knew it, by step three, I was back in religion. And, and I, I just could not get them separated. And... And there was a guy, Hammer and Hank, they called him in Sacramento. He was a, a carpenter. And uh, there were so many Hanks, they had to have nicknames. And this was Hammer and Hank. And, and, and Hammer and Hank came up to me one night and he said, you know, you, you're just having all sorts of problem with this spirituality. And he said, you know, one of the things that somebody told me, he said, was uh, if you could imagine a guy out like in the country uh, someday and he's in, uh, there's a meadow over here and there's a couple of young horses in it, little foals, and, and there's one of them in particular is like running about and kicking and neighing and nipping the others and, and just, and one, one, of, one of the guys says to the other, boy, that's a spirited animal. What did he mean? And I said, you mean like full of life and lively? Yeah. Or you got a little kid who falls down and gets up and just grins and runs on. You go, spirited kid. But would you ever say that that's a religious animal? <laughs> so... I, I I went back to Father Joe and I said I told him this and he said I think that really that really works because spirit I says you know because back in the Stone Age uh, when we went to seminary you had to learn a lot of Latin and uh, uh, and uh, he he said where does spirit come from and I said spirio s p i r a o and that means I breathe I breathe. Religion is from re, which means again, and ligio, which is to connect, like ligament. So religion connects you to your tradition and has rituals. Spirituality has to do with the fact of being alive. And that when your spirit leaves you, we say you expire, right? Your spirit exits. Uh, and so I began to get it that spirituality was different. And and when I was in, in back in, in D.C., um, we were at a meeting, and, and this guy, Buck Doyle, who was like Mr. AA around Washington, D.C. in those days, uh, and uh, uh, he, like Sandy Beach and all these people, were all pretty new compared to Buck Doyle. And, uh, and Buck was an old flying tiger. He was a pal of General Chenault and all of this kind of stuff. And he was like a you know, big, long-time sober AA. And... Uh, and one night we're all like, we're all like young people and we're all at the table and we're all, you know, having a great time and we're being loud and noisy and all in the Marriott. And, and I, I feel these hands on my shoulders and I look up and it's Buck Doyle. And he leans over and he says, I don't want to interrupt this, but I want to put a name on it while it's happening. This is spirituality. It's not some droopy drawer shit you do in church. And, <laughs> and, and you know, I, I really, I was like, a, a number of people had to shock me out of that religiosity. 
into the fact that my recovery, and, and later Father Joe pointed out page 27 to me, you know, where, um, where Carl Jung is talking about what a spirit, vital spiritual experience is. And, and I, I was telling, you know, Joe, I said, well, how will I know I have, is it like a feeling I get or something? And he said, go to page 27. And on page 27, incidentally, I give these page numbers out for the Protestants. <clears throat> I, I, I'll tell you why. Uh, growing up in Castle Dare, County Tyrone, we had Catholics and Protestants. And most of the Protestants, particularly the Presbyterians, all walked up to church with their Bibles. And when the preacher quoted something, they wanted to know chapter and verse and the translation. You know, one of those offbeat translations it has to be the King James, you know. And so they they checked up on what the preacher said, right? Because they didn't want him to be making it up, you know. Uh, the Catholics all sat there and the priest quoted something. They probably, they're sitting there going, it's probably close enough. You know? uh, uh, so... Uh, <laughs> So, so if I mention numbers, it's because I really think that being a Protestant in AA in that sense is a really good thing. Um, but, uh, uh, but on page 27, uh, when I got to it, uh, you know, it, Jung is talking about the only remedy known for alcoholism. And it is a vital spiritual experience. And he describes it so well. He said, it is in the nature of huge emotional displacement and rearrangement. Ideas, emotions, and attitudes that were previously the guiding force in the lives of these men is set aside and a whole new set of conceptions and motives begin to dominate them. He said, when that happens, you've had a spiritual awakening. It's not just some passing feeling. And and I wanted to get it like right then. And I, I was telling at the at the uh, panel about you know my impatience. I wanted five years after three months, you know, and uh, and I was really pissed off that I was going to have to wait five whole years to get a five year chip. You know, it was like it just didn't seem fair. You know, there there ought to be some double points or something. You know, you could like get it quicker. You know, and or know somebody. You know, and and, and get one. You know, and, and two. You know, maybe. And uh, but uh, so it 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 was kind of disillusioning, and I had to like take a deep breath when when Father Joe said, you know, you look at step twelve. Step twelve says having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. You mean I'm going to have to take step four, right? <laughs> and yeah, that's the kind of what I'm saying, you know. So I had to start out on the path and walk the path of steps that led from here to there. And a path of steps, a step is nowhere. It's just a step along a path. And you have a bed upstairs, you're not going to go to the third step and stay there. You know, it's like, I think I'll spend the night here. Uh, you know, I, I mean, steps go from one place to another place and then between you're nowhere, you know. And so, and so it's really important that we keep on moving is the way I kind of look at it. But and these are only my opinions, but I, um, they, uh, but I stole them from people with good sobriety. Um, <laughs> Uh, what, one of the, one of the things that, that kind of, uh, struck me also was that, you know, in, um, in doing the steps, I was using AA as a kind of a, now that I'm not drinking, I can get my act back together. You know, sometimes you hear people saying that, well, now that you're not drinking and using, you can get your act back together. And I began to realize that that was part of my problem, was I was putting my act back together. And, 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 and it really recovery is about coming to realize that I am enough without the act. If I'm putting my act back together, it means my life is dominated by fear of inadequacy. 
and 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 the authenticity that comes out of working the steps. Uh, I mean, I, I was using like, okay, I'm going to make a list here of all my defects in step four, and I'm going to admit it to God, myself, and another human being. I'm going to be completely willing that they're, they're be removed, and then I'm going to give God my list and say, please remove these defects. Spiritually, that is probably the most ridiculous thing you could say. I made this list, my ego, my sickness, the person who was just got through trying to kill me. <laughs> and I'm asking my creator to follow my blueprint for my improvement. <laughs> Spiritually, somehow that doesn't work, you know. <laughs> you know, you're not the doctor and he's not the pharmacist. You know, so uh, when we got it back to front like that, you know, which is where uh, my sponsor kind of spent a lot of time on step seven with me because step seven humbly, humbly means what the hell do I know? The trouble, if any of you are familiar with the Bible, I am not talking about religion really, I'm talking about wisdom, but if you're familiar with the Bible, in the first chapter of Genesis, we know the problem started when human beings couldn't wait to know the difference between right and wrong and good and bad, because they ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which would make them like unto God. And thus, through pride, shame entered the world, because the next couple of Verses, they have covered themselves because they are ashamed. Interesting connection between step seven, because step seven says humbly, and how does the prayer go? My creator, I am now willing you should have all of me, good and bad. And I'm leaving it up to you. If there's anything stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows, feel free to remove it. Meanwhile, I'm going to try to do your will. I'm going to get out of the self-improvement. I'm not going to put my act back together again. Uh, maybe I am not broken. Maybe it was my pride that had me always watching myself and ashamed of myself. And 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 uh, Father Joe, you know, was was very spiritually. Uh, uh, he's a very spiritual man, and. I remember him telling me, he said, you know, yourself, I read that thing, you know, in the chapter 4 of the 12 and 12 where it talks about uh, our defects are really our natural instincts aggravated by our self-centered fear. And I became, came to realize that my natural instincts to be of value to be responsible financially for those uh, in my family, pay my bills, to have love and affection and sex in my life, to have food and drink, and to have leisure and recreation. Really natural instincts. But if they are aggravated by my fear, self-centered fear, that I am not enough, pride, I won't have enough. Avarice, lust, gluttony, sloth. You know, I, and I began to realize that I was banging away on my defects when in fact the problem was my self-centered fear. And as Father Joe put it, it's like banging on the barometer thinking you're going to change the weather. It is my self-centered fears that I am not enough, that I won't have enough, and that what I have I will, will be taken from me my envy and my anger. And, and I got it finally that this whole thing made such sense that my self-centered fears aggravated my normal human instincts. And that what I needed to be working on through faith and relationship with my higher power and my spiritual path is my self-centered fears. And, uh, uh, the the um, 
so the program, the spiritual path for me has been one of coming in a, in a, a strange roundabout way to a humble self-acceptance that what I have been made by my creator is enough. And it's not about me improving on it. It's about using it to serve my creator's purpose, which gets step 11, which is praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry it out. I said I'd come back to the place Truman's, uh, my first place uh, where I'd ride out. And uh, I went there and, uh, you know, I was, if any of you have been to any of these places, you know the first day you don't want to meet anybody. And I was kind of shaky and, 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 you know, I thought, oh, my room, I'm going to stay here the rest of the day. And, and I'm no sooner in the room than the rock comes to the door and says, Truman wants you down for lunch. I, I don't feel like lunch. Thank you. Uh, Truman says you're to come down for lunch. So I went down. There's this big long farm table in a big farm uh, house. And he's at one end and there's like 18 people at the table. And there's one empty spot. And the guy leads me over like a horse with blinders on. You know, I'm not looking at anybody. I'm sitting down. And they bring out lunch. If any of you guys have had the shakes, you know the worst thing to eat in public is soup. <laughs> That's what they had for lunch. And I knew... It was impossible, so I didn't touch it till Truman looked down and he said, uh, Seamus, eat your lunch, you're going to need it. And uh, I, I don't feel, I eat your lunch. And I thought, no, I'll try it, maybe a miracle. And I get up to about here and the spoon starts going and spill. And I let it fall. And the guy sitting beside me on the right said the rudest thing anybody ever said to a high official of the Diocese of Sacramento. You got a pretty good shake. <laughs> and I was like shocked that somebody would mention it. They never had mentioned it in the cathedral at lunch. And uh, of course, I never ate soup in the cathedral at lunch either. Um, so uh, then the guy on the other side uh, nudged me and he said, mine is almost gone. And I looked, and sure enough, he did have a little shake. And then they pointed to this old guy across the table who had like one tooth, and he's brown as a berry, and he must be 80, and he's grinning. And he says, look at that old fart over there. He's been here six weeks, and he's still putting it in his ear. And, and he was, you know, he was like, and he's grinning. And, and I thought, you know, this is a strange place. This is a place where you can shake without being ashamed. You can talk about your shake. We went out on the porch afterwards, and we were talking about lying and drunk driving arrests and what jail was worse than which and, you know, all of this kind of stuff and where you hid the bottles and how you got rid of empties and all of this sort of stuff. And it was like the greatest experience of my life. I felt that I had been a Martian up until that time. And I finally found a colony of my people. You know, this is a place you can let the antenna go up, you know, and, and you can, you know, and, 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 and I think the great thing about our fellowship is this, that it, we join it at the point of humility, humiliation even, and somehow that's the basis of our commonality. We're not sitting around smoking big cigars at the Pacific Union Club talking about how successful we were and all the great deals we did. No, we're, we come into this program talking about our shakes, talking about how sh guilty and shameful we are uh, in our lives and how we're, we're so depressed about it, the way we're living and, and how we've disappointed people who love us. And we come in at that level and we're joined, we're grafted into the human race at that point of vulnerability. And somehow, as long I know, as long as I keep connected to that vine or that tree, 
I, I get the life coming through me. Whereas if I'm cut off from it, uh, I'm a branch that withers. So for me, uh, it is like the greatest privilege. It is also my greatest sense, source of gratitude uh, to be connected to every single one of you in this fellowship. And I thank you for listening to me.